in case you say it's the case. I want to remind you, God got you here. God brought you here. God is keeping you here. And you ought to just praise him for one more chance. He is the holy God. He's God all by himself. We ought to just bless his name. I said we ought to just bless his name. We ought to bless, bless his name. He is. He is. He is God. Hallelujah. We've come today to lift up none other than the name of Jesus. None other than the name of Jesus. I had a privilege to go to the, the Homer Street Church in 3rd Ward, Houston, Texas this morning. And for some reason, they're lifting up the name Jesus. Early in the morning, they're lifting up Jesus' name. So I, I left Central Houston and came over here to Southeast Houston. And for some reason or the other, we are lifting up the name of Jesus. I believe we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's power in the name of Jesus. There's strength in the name of Jesus. There's hope in the name of Jesus. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. There is miraculous working power in the name of Jesus. There's nobody like our God. He is God in three persons. He is the, tri the triune God. He is the Trinity himself. And we've come to lift him this morning. We've come to praise him this morning. We come to lift up the name of Jesus the Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We call your attention to St. Matthew chapter 27. The book is St. Matthew, the chapter is 27, verses are 32 and 33. Matthew chapter 27, verses 32 and 33. For all the Bible scholars, forgive me for stopping in the middle of a sentence at a comma. You'll see it when you read it. When you found it, you will discover these words. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to the place called Golgotha, that is to say the skull, the place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. I want to say to you today, you are important. You are important. You are important. As we are today blessed in the midst of the month of February, we have an extra day to celebrate black history. <laughs> Although February is usually the usually, usually, and still is the shortest month of the year, we ought to stop for a moment and listen to what God has to say to us about black history. You see, black history is not just the pigmentation of your skin. It is more than that because during this time, we encourage young black children to think much of who you are. It is no accident. It is not something that got past God, the reason why your skin is the color it is. It is no accident by who you are and where you were born. 
God has blessed us even this morning to know that we are important and we are important to God. Amen. Oftentimes people have problems regardless of who they are and regardless of how they were born. They have issues with the color of their skin. You got to know and you have to know that God did not make a mistake. Whatever you're going through, whatever you've been through, God is at work behind the scene. He is preparing you to utilize where you are and what you're going through in the future. God has prepared you regardless of how tough it is. God is preparing you for the now and the future. God has a way. God has a way of doing things that confuses us. He, he does things that, that we don't know where he headed. Because if we knew where God was headed, then we wouldn't need faith. If we, if we had faith, if we, if we just had a little faith, we wouldn't worry about what God is doing. But I admit to you and submit to you this morning that it's hard sometimes to figure out what God is doing. I tell you, I tell you what, uh, being born in the backwoods of Mississippi on Four Mile Plantation, where they wanted men to talk to teenagers, boys, and say, Mr. I have discovered that even through it all, God knew what he was doing. When, when, when daddy would say, I'm not doing that, and they would say, oh, yes, you are, and daddy stood flat-footed and said, no, that I'm not doing. It's because God knows that we have to have some kind of self-esteem. We have to teach our children, our girls, and our boys that they are important. Deacon, I forgot a little ringing. We have to teach them that regardless of what you look like, regardless of how other people treat you, you are important and you are important to God. We cannot tell our children stuff that I, I hear on a regular basis. You are nothing. You will never be nothing. And you just like your old daddy, mama, whatever. We have to get to a point in our lives where we realize that what we say make a difference. We still, even as adults, living behind this little raggedy statement that says, sticks and stones may break my bone, but words will never hurt me. Well, if words didn't hate and didn't hurt, people wouldn't say it. Sometimes people are intending to break you. Some words they intend to mess up your mind. Some words they intend to, to blow you away. On yesterday, they've, uh, they've allowed Drayvon Green to come back, and he got in another tussle. And he was frustrating the opposing team, the entire team. He was frustrating them. And they were trying to frustrate him. But the moment he got in the big boy's head, he ran back down the court pointing at his head and saying, I got him now. I got in his head. Let me share with you. Sometimes people just trying to get in your head. They're trying to make you lose. And God delivered me from couples who will say in and everything to each other as if they want to kill each other. And once it comes out, it's done. Once it's said, it's destroying. And therefore, we have to lift each other up. And as we move, we have to understand that everybody is important to God. Regardless of who you are, regardless of where you were born, regardless of how you were born, regardless if a daddy was on the scene or not, let me just tell you, everybody got a daddy whether he's on the scene or not. 
Don't let stuff in your life trip you up for life. Make sure you understand that I'm somebody. Dr. King would say it like this. Don't let people let you think or make you think that you don't have a strength and you have no somebodiness. You are somebody. You are special. You are important. You make a difference. When we look at the text, Matthew chapter 27, when we look at the text, Jesus is headed to Calvary. We look at the text, we see Pilate is about to take charges, and, and when he gets to a point where he's taking charges, his wife comes to him and says, I had a dream last night. You need to stop threatening and stop trying to kill an innocent man. Pilate went and wiped his hand because he washed his hands because uh, they could not give anything against this man called Jesus. Pilate says, I washed my hand of him. Yeah. Who will you let me go free? It was a custom once a year to let a criminal go free. They chose Barabbas. He says, but he hadn't done anything. Jesus hadn't done anything. They said, let Barabbas go. Let me tell you, sometimes folks will, 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 will attack you for no apparent reason. Sometimes people will attack you for what is right before they attack you for what is wrong. Sometimes people will get on your nerves just to say they got on your nerves. Sometimes people will choose the worst over the best. And that's what we see in today's American culture. We will choose what is bad. We will choose somebody who has said to you that I'm bad. We will choose somebody that has said to you what they're going to do, and then they have turned around and done it. But we are teetling and toddling in these great United States of America whether or not we should choose one with over 90-something charges. <laughs> That's how it was in Jesus' day. The way it was in Jesus' day, you have Barabbas, uh, he ought to be executed. You have Barabbas, somebody who, who, who walks and do in and everything. You have Barabbas, a, a terrorist. You have Barabbas, somebody who, who will be an insurrectionist. And the people said, let Barabbas go. Here we are with an innocent man. Jesus, an innocent man. And they chose a terrorist. They chose to put, put young folks, sometimes your friends will choose those who are wrong before they choose you who are right. But don't let your Sunday school attendance cause you to have low self-esteem. Don't let your church attendance cause you to feel bad about yourself. I just stopped by on my way to the rapture to let you know you are important and you are important to God. When we move through the text, we watch through the text. As we go through the text, they offer Jesus some galls. <laughs> Judas has already gone out and hung himself. Judas comes back after he sells Jesus out. For a few pieces of silver, he comes back to the high priest and says to the, to the governor, he says, I have sinned. I have fallen short. I have messed up. And he tries to give it back to him. They said, that's your business. <laughs> you, you have told us. You have turned them, turned them over to us. It's your business what you do now. Judas goes out and hangs him himself. He's already turned Jesus over. Jesus is headed before the cross. I told you last week that Jesus prophesied that, hey, uh, my time is winding up. My time is over here. I say to you again today that your time is winding up. 
Doesn't matter how many gym memberships you have. Doesn't matter how you built. It doesn't matter how you think. It doesn't matter how your mind is able to calculate numbers all together. It doesn't matter if you have a photogenic memory or not. Your time is winding up. The question is, if you only had 30 days to live, what would you change? If you only had 30 days to live and you knew you had 30 days to live, would you be as grouchy as you are? If you only had 30 days to live, who would you forgive? If you only had 30 days to live, would you treat your family members better? If you only had 30 days to live, would you talk back to your mama? If you knew you had only 30 days to live, would you be still in line and cussing? One of the most miserable things that I've ever done as a pastor was go to the bedside of a woman and the doctor said to her, she won't make it through the night. The part that wasn't terrible is, the part that was terrible was not the fact that the doctor said you won't make it through the night. The part that was terrible is that the lady never forgave her family members. Three, three little children stood by her bedside. I stood by her bedside. And while I was standing there, this woman was still talking bad about her family. She had less than 24 hours to live. The doctor had confirmed it. Jesus had almost confirmed it. She had only less than 24 hours to live. And she spent that last 24 hours telling her little children about how bad her family is. I said to her, this is the time, sister, this is the time that you stop a halt. You, this is the time that you forgive. This is the time that you make sure that you share with your children what you want their future to be like. This is the time that you share with your children how to get close to the Lord. This is your last moment on planet Earth. And this woman died talking about how bitter she was. And she didn't even want to get it right. She left the last words in her children's head that your no good uncle and auntie ain't right. The last thing she said was how they treated me when I was 16. 50 some year old woman, she left planet earth without forgiving. She left planet earth without getting it right with the Lord. She left planet earth without telling her children to get it right with God. That was most miserable for me. Usually when folk are on their dying bed, I can say just two or three words and they can turn it around. Usually when people are on their dying bed, you can say something to them and it will click that I need to spend these last few hours talking to the Lord and telling my children good things about the Lord. But this woman died talking to her children about miserable things. If you had only 24 hours to live, what would you do differently? Whatever you would do differently, you need to start doing that today. Whatever you would do differently, you need to make sure right now you start doing differently because we are not guaranteed the day nor the hour that we get out of here. Your wellest day, your perfectly well day is a good day to get out of here. You're sick enough right now to die instantly. We can ask the undertaker in the corner to come in right now because somebody can leave here right now in good health. But I want to let you know you're important to God. And you need to know that because you're important to God, God wants to use you while you're here. God wants to use that New Year's resolution you made. <laughs> God wants to use you. Don't sit and wait till you get blessed in order to bless others. Amen. I say to those who are blessed today, I say to you that you are not so blessed just to be blessed. You're blessed so you can bless other people. How many times you've shared Jesus Christ? How many times have you, you blessed other people in the grocery line? How many times have you bought something for somebody that have done you wrong? How many times have somebody called you out on your mess and you just kept right on doing it? I want to tell you today, God is alive. <laughs> he is not dead. 
He's sitting and he's waiting and, and the promises we made to each other. And some of us, I told you, some of us have made promises that like this, for better and for worse. For richer and for poor. In sickness and in health. And we have not kept our promises. God has something for you. And it doesn't matter what color you are. When we look at the text, we find Jesus has a heavy cross. He's on his way to Calvary. The cross wasn't heavy because the wood was heavy. The cross was heavy because he was carrying your sins and my sins on the cross. And because Jesus was carrying your sins and my sins on the cross, the Bible teaches that he fell down. And then when we look at verse 32, the natives, the, the religious folk. I want to say to you today, religious folk will mess you up. Re re religious folk will trip you out. Religious folk will blame you for stuff that they did. Religious folk are not concerned about a relationship or a fellowship with God. Religion folk is still talking about the tradition of old. I know some people have asked me and they wondered, why you don't, why you don't have three big chairs and then two small chairs up here in the pulpit? It's because this is not the pulpit that was at Jerusalem. The Jerusalem pulpit was one that was segregated. The Jerusalem pulpit was one that if you walked into it and you was not called to do it, God would take you out of here. But we have been set free by Jesus, and because we've set free by Jesus, we need to welcome folk into the church, whether they're gay or straight. I think I said one more time. We have to welcome people, whether they're gay or straight, simply because they got to worship somewhere. If you want them to get right, if you want them to find Jesus, this is the house they ought to be in. Now when they get here, if I come across it in the word, I got to teach it as it is in the word. Because I've come to realize that, that homosexuality is just as bad and right along beside whoremongering. Woman, woman said to the pastor one day, said, Pastor, why you won't let those homosexuals come in and, and do some things? He said, well, I don't support that. And so I said to the pastor, do you support Deacon get right, and deacon get right is a known heterosexual whoremonger. What I'm saying to you is you got to stop looking down at other people because your sin is different because you got sin, I got sin, and that's why Jesus' cross was so heavy because he had to carry your sin and my sin. It's a shame that I have to tell brothers when they come out of prison, I said, now look, now look, brother, when you come to church, don't walk around with a flag saying, I just got out of prison. Don't walk around telling people that you just got out of prison because church is not always sanctified. Matter of fact, the church has not been glorified because you will be judged by many simply because you've been locked up. They don't care if you were guilty or not, but they've been locked up. I mean, I went to this church, I went to this church, and when I got to the church, I was dressed pretty well. I, I had just taken a bath, the pastor invited me. I said, look, pastor, I'm gonna, be I'm gonna be late. I sit on the back row, and that's what you ought to do when you're late, sit down somewhere. I sit on the back row, and when I sit on the back row, these two women grab their purse and they slid over. I begin to smell myself. I begin to look at myself. And then when church was over, the pastor recognized all the preachers. Then I stood up and they started smiling at me. I said, it's too late now, baby. You have bruised my ego. You have told me when somebody walk in that, that you don't know, they are not welcome there. And crazy as I am, Reverend Williams, crazy as I am, when I went up to shake the pastor's hand, they were in line right in front of me. I said, Pastor, are these members of, of, of this church? He said, yeah, they're a faithful member. I said, well, let me just tell the story. Right in front of them. 
Because if we're going to change, we got to accept our problems. If we're going to make a difference in life, we got to make sure we treat everybody right. We got to treat the burglar and the thief right. We got to treat everybody right. Now, let me just share with you. There come a day, there will come a day where the Bible says in order to bind the household, in order to attack the household, you got to first bind the strong man. Now, if you're the strong man, don't let anybody come in the house and do anything. Verse 32. The Bible says that after they had gambled for Jesus' clothes, after they had rolled dice, after they had gambled for Jesus' clothes and they finished marking him, hell to the king of the Jews. They marked him. Verse 32 says, now as they came out, they found a man of serene. Simon by name. Serene is a place in Africa. Now we look at it as a place in Libya. Serene was a place of the dark-skinned people. I just wanted to just talk to you just a few minutes about the fact that you are important even if you're not from a place that people recognize. I want to talk to you this morning and tell you you are important even if you're not in the history books. We got to be careful how we read history books now because they're taking stuff out. They're removing and extracting and they, they putting it out. And they're writing their own history. Let me just share with you. You can't rewrite history because the only reason it's history is because it's in the past. And if we look at our history, we will find out that we are important. We will look at somebody like uh, George Washington Carver that, that took over 300 things and made them from one pe pecan. We would look at people like Dr. MLK Jr. That, that marched and walked for civil rights. We would look at people like Fannie Lou Hamer that got locked up, put in jail just for the right to vote, got beat up. We would look at them. We would look at, at people like ben Benjamin Banneker who, who drew the whole Washington area. We would look at people like Rosa Parks that, that didn't want to get up and she didn't get up. Let me tell you, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. We, got, we have to teach our children. We have to teach our children that when you stand, make sure you're standing for what is right. Make sure you stand for, for what is going to happen that will take your future father. We got to make sure that we don't make bonehead decisions for right now that will affect our lives the rest of our lives. That's why we say young people, young people, whatever you do, police pull you over. It doesn't matter if it's a he or a she, always give respect. If you don't say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am now, when he pulls you over or she pulls you over, you better buy a yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am from somewhere. No, it's not yeah. It's not uh-huh. It's yes, ma'am. And when he or she walks up to the car, even if they're five, two, or four, two feet tall, Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, officer. Because the idea is to make it home safely. The idea is to make sure you make it home without blood stained clothes. The idea is to fight your case in court. When we teach young people respect, then young people can give respect. And they can receive respect. Here it is. Simon of Cyrene, an African man. Man with dark skins. He was so important that they chose him to help Jesus carry the cross. Let me just share with you. That, that doesn't mean anything to some people. That, that means nothing to, to some people. The, the leaders thought that they chose him to carry the cross. The leaders thought that they were doing him a disservice to carry the cross. The leaders thought that they were making him carry the cross, but God has it all set up and he's working in the background to make sure that you know that you are important and that God is setting you up for a blessing. You, you know, I, I've taken so many classes. I said, now I know I can't use all this stuff. And that's what children say today. Why do I have to take algebra if I'm not going in that field? 
Why do I have to take this class if I'm not going to be a part of that field? Everything that you do makes a difference in your future. We have children that come here all the time, take robotics and take music, and they get to a point where they're sick and tired and sick and tired of taking music and sick and tired and too grown to take robotics. But those disciplines teach you to be disciplined. They teach you structure. And they teach you if this happened, then there will be an equal or uh, opposite right reaction. If it happens, then this will happen. We have to get to a point where we understand that we have to broaden our children's horizon, broaden their brain. I told you two weeks ago, a brother got married at 26 years old and had never left Third Ward. He went to the grocery store in Third Ward. He went to the doctor in Third Ward. He went to school in third ward. He went to church in third ward. It took his wife to come and marry him to get him on Mexican soil. God is working things out for you. God is working things on your behalf. Don't fight it. Stick with it. Know that you are special. You need to remember people like John Lewis, Aretha Franklin, W.B. Du Bois. We have to remember people other than Michael Jordan. We got to remember somebody other than C.J. Stroud. We got to remember somebody other than J.J. Watt. We have to know that all children are not going to be professional football, basketball, baseball players. The average year is one million students came out of college during the year that Michael Jordan came out. And they had decided that they were going to take Michael Jordan's job. One million students, only about 500 of them were able to play on a college level. And then only about 20 of those same students went to the NBA. And then the average football player only plays the average. I didn't, I didn't talk about the ones that are making 16 years. The average is four years. So you spend 22 years preparing for this craft that you will only work four years and be an expert at it and then when you finish you're all broken up it's only four years a four year average and then you realize that man I should have gotten my education get your education now because no one can take it from you Get your education while you're young, while you're on top of things. Get your education so you can think because you can think and no one can take it from you. Simon was appointed to carry Jesus' cross. Very important job. Let me say to you, important people are called to do important jobs. <laughs> People who, who love themselves are important to God, and people who love themselves do important things. If you don't know what you're going to do, ask God about it. If you don't know how you're going to come by doing it, spend some time with God. Here's Cyrene just standing on the sideline. They say, you get over here and you carry this cross. And some people on the sideline thought it was a job that was beneath them. If you're the ditch digger, make sure you're the best ditch digger in town. If you are a hair twirler, make sure you're the best hair twirler in town. If you are a barber, make sure you're the best barber around. Make sure you get in and make sure you do your best. And when you do your best, when you work like it's all dependent on you, then you ought to pray like it's all dependent on God. For when you work like it's all dependent on you and you pray like it's all dependent on God, it will be successful in the sight of God. We, we're worried. We have, we have limited sight. We, we see right now. And if you look at the way your conditions are right now, you'll give up. You will quit. You'll throw in the towel. You won't, you won't continue in, your, in, in what you're going through. You will not do your best because, oh, this is about nothing. But even those little small things that you are doing now make a world of a difference. Simon pulled off the sideline to carry the cross. The Bible says he was compelled. 
He was made. Let me just share with you. Sometimes people think they're making you do something. They, they, they're not making you do anything. God has it all lined up. I said to you, Peter, cut off Malchus's ear. They came to arrest Jesus, and, and Peter had his little attitude on. And yeah, we need some folk with some swords in the house. I said, we need some people with some attitude sometime. We need some people that's not afraid to stand flat-footed. That's why I want dope dealers to come. That's why I want gangbangers to come, because they're not scared. I can get me about 500 gangbangers and turn this world upside down because they are not scared. They will walk in the door with an attitude. You better not mess over my church. You better not do this to my. You better walk up right when you come in the door. They are not scared. But we've been saved so long. We just stand back and look. I remember the day we were, we were practicing our escape plan where everybody would hit the floor and then we would get up off the floor and we would run outside and get in line, just, just kind of like they do at school. And I remember one lady got in the hall, in the, in the center aisle, getting out on her knees. I said, baby, what you doing? You, you were over here sitting. Now you got in the hallway and made yourself visible. Sometimes we've been saved so long that we can't think with common sense. And when we think with common sense, it keeps us out of danger. God doesn't have a problem with you having common sense. God knows what you're going through. He prepares a way, you, a way for you in the presence of your enemies. And that's God asking you to get out the way. Here it is, Simon. Simon of Cyrene. Even if they choose you because of your color, bless the Lord for it. Even if they misuse you because of your color, thank God for it. James says, count it all joy. When you fall in the midst of divers temptation, count it all joy. You ought to be rejoicing when they misuse you. Because you know that God is doing something right now with you that's going to bless you and others later. Simon carries this cross. He carries the cross of Jesus. He's compelled to do it. And when they had come to the place called Golgotha, when they had come to the place of the skull, when they had come to the place where uh, it is shaped like a man's skull, like a man's head, when they had come to that place, then they tried to offer him a sour wine. Let me just share with you, God has a place for you. God has a time for you. We don't know where, we don't know when, but God has a place and a time for you, and you don't even know when it's going to happen. You have to walk with him. Walk with him and carry your cross as God has a cross for everybody. Sister Henry, it was February 16th, 1914. 2014. Is that what your history book says? Okay. It's a cross that we <laughs> only the new beginning church members talk back to you while you're in the middle of it. <laughs> February 14, I said to you, 2014, I said to you that everybody has a cross to bear. All of us have something to carry. And guess what? Sometimes we gotta carry it a long ways. Sometimes we have to carry it a long time. Sometimes we have to deal with it. And as we deal with, that's why I'm a proponent of counseling. You need to go talk to somebody who is, who is real with you. Somebody who's educated with it. Somebody who has gotten some learning about it. Because your pastor can't solve your own problem. Because guess what? He got here a boatload of them himself. I think I said it again. Brother Carter, your pastor can't solve your own problem. Not all of your problems. Because your pastor got a shipload, a boatload, a yacht load of issues that he got to deal with himself. And I'm trying to figure me out. <laughs> so you got to get with somebody who knows how to do it. He carries this cross for Jesus. They get to the place called the skull. And it was at that place called the skull 
that my Lord and your God was hung between two thieves. It was a place of the skull, the place called Golgotha, that, that mean men killed him. It was a place called Calvary that, that they hung in between two brothers that deserved to die. It was at a place called Calvary. They hung him high. It was at Calvary that they stretched him wide. It was at Calvary that they raised him up. It was at Calvary that they dropped him low. It was at Calvary that they killed my Lord and killed my God. It was at Calvary on Calvary's cross, the place of the skull, the place called Golgotha, that Jesus carried my sins far away. Some writer said, buried he carried my sins far away. Dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he made me who I am. It was on Calvary after he died, I tell you. That same Jesus that was an innocent man. That same Jesus that was no important person to them. That same Jesus died on Calvary. He died, I tell you. It was on Golgotha. It was on the hill. It was the hill of the skull. He died on Calvary. They took him off the cross. That same Jesus, they buried in a barber tomb. They put him in a cave. They, they buried my Lord and your God on a barber tomb. He stayed there Friday. He stayed there Friday night. He stayed there Saturday. He stayed there Saturday night. But the Bible says, early that third day morning, with all power in heaven and earth, he got up, I tell you, that same Jesus rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. That same Jesus that they killed on Calvary, that same Jesus they mocked in the courtroom, that same Jesus died on Calvary. All of that third day morning, he got up, I tell you. He got up with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. That same Jesus got up for those who have low self-esteem. Those who are confused about who they are. He, he got up early that third day morning. He walked around here some 40 days. Tabernacled in this earth. But then he caught a cloud. He got out of here told the disciples you need to stop looking and gazing like there is no hope the same Jesus that got up on Cal from Calvary the same Jesus that got up from the grave he got out of here and caught a cloud and now he's sitting on the right hand of the father making intercessions for us that's why we have to confess our sin that's why we ought to repent of our sin because Jesus is making intercession for us that same Jesus that died on Calvary. The same Jesus they buried in a barber tomb. The same Jesus that rose early that third day morning. I'm telling you, he caught a cloud and got out of here. The same Jesus that's sitting on the right hand of the Father. One of these old days, at the trump of God. One of these old days, at the voice of the archangel. One of these old days, he will crack the sky. And the dead in Christ shall ride first. Those of us who are black, those of us who are white, if we believe the story, those of us who are Hispanic will get up from the grave and we will forever be with the Lord. If the music is too loud for you down here, I got good news for you. Wait just a while. On the other side, every day is going to be worship. We're going to crowd around the throne of God. I'm going to join in with the four beastly creatures. I'm going to join in with the 24 elders crying, holy, holy, holy. Blessed is the lamb. Blessed is the lamb. Blessed is the lamb. Oh, lamb. Blessed is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. His name is Jesus. Mary's oldest child. His name is Jesus. God's only begotten son. His name is Jesus. God's one of a kind child. His name is Jesus. He is God's unique child. He's coming back to get a church without a spot or a wrinkle. 
and we will forever be with the Lord. We're going to sure enough celebrate down here. You think we're really celebrating right now? You think we're really shouting right now? Folk talking about, I want to see Adam. I want to see Big Mama Nim. I want to see Jesus, the one who died for me. Because from Emmanuel's veins flows healing power. After Jesus died on Calvary, they pierced him in his side. And it was evident that he was already dead. That same Jesus that was dead. He's alive right now. How you know he's alive? Every time I see the sun come up in the eastern hemisphere, make his tracks across to the western hemisphere, I'm reminded that Jesus lived. Whenever I come to the saints and to the house of the Lord and I see the saints of the Lord celebrating God's goodness, I'm reminded that Jesus lived. Whenever I'm able to put one foot in front of the other, I'm reminded that Jesus lived. But the good news today, when I look around over the shoulders of my life and I see what God has already done, to me, through me, and with me. I know he lives. Jesus lives. He walks with me. He talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. Hallelujah to the Lamb. His name is Jesus. He's alive. He's a well. And he's living within us. The door open. The door is open. The door. The door is open. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment. You are important to God. You are so important, God wants to welcome you to heaven. You're so important to God that he's going to give you a brand new body. How many of you have aches every now and then? How, how many of you... Every now and then, the inside of yourself talks to the outside of yourself. How many of you know that every now and then, when, I, when you want to get up, you just can't pop up? You have to think this thing through now. And when you do move, the inside of you says, wait a minute. Slow down now. Take your time. And every now and then, we'll hear a little pop or a little creak. It's because we're leaving here. And since you know you got to leave, you need to go somewhere that's better than right here. I recommend heaven where the Son of God will light up the place. From now on, the Son of God, the S-O-N, will be the light of that world. You need to be born again. You need to be saved. Because if you don't go to heaven, you're going to hell. And hell is not a beautiful place. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. They talk about they and their buddies are going to party down there. The only celebration we going on is over yonder. Don't you want to go? If you've never received Jesus as your personal savior, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. The door is open. The door is open. Will you come? Will you come? Yeah, Lord. Some folks choose silver and gold. You better choose Jesus. Choose Jesus. Lord, will you come? And forget Don't forget about your soul. About souls. I've, I've come to the conclusion. I've come to a decision. To make Jesus and I'm going to make Jesus my choice. I'm going to make Jesus my choice. Will you make Jesus your choice? The road is rough. This road is rough. And the going is tough. In the hills. And the hills are it's a tough thing. hard to climb. Yeah, Lord. Oh, I started out. Yeah, 
Lord. A long time ago. And there is no doubt in my mind. I've come to the conclusion. I made a decision. Jesus to make Jesus 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 is my choice Just bow your head with me. Just bow your head with me and invite Jesus in. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now make me a new person. Come into my life and save me. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe if you honestly prayed this prayer, trusting in this gospel story that you're saved and that you're on your way to heaven. If you're here today and you struggle like I do with life, I want to pray for us. You know they say life happens. What that means is stuff just creeps up on you. I mean, it just shows up and it robs you like an armed man. I mean, stuff just shows up. I mean, you can be, you can be doing excellent one minute. And all of a sudden, bam, life happens. And when life happens, it doesn't always usher in happiness. It doesn't always usher in joy. But when we got Jesus... He's able to keep us in the middle of life. Father God, we come now thanking you, Lord, for who you are and what you do. Now life has happened. Lord, things are not what we want them to be. Lord, somebody's about to give up. Lord, somebody's about to give out. Somebody's thinking about quitting. Lord, I ask you to bless them. Strengthen them. Hold them. Minister to them as only you can. Lord, bless them, Father God, to know you as God. To trust you as God. And I ask you to bless them to be beneficiaries of who you are as God. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. It is offering time. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand way up in the air. Please raise your hand.